Uh, Zwer Fenn, uh, born on uh, August 14th, 1924. So three years from now, he will be, uh, will have the centennial. He died in 2009, uh, a very important Norwegian uh, architect who received the Pritzker Prize in Architecture in uh, 2000, uh, in, uh, 109, in, uh, in, in 1997. Uh, and I think he was the first architect from Norway to receive the Pritzker, and maybe until now also the, the only one. Anyway, uh, of course, the, the, there are other important architects in, in, uh, in Norway, like Snoheta, but uh, Zverefen is, uh, is uh, an architect whose work is worth, uh, worth knowing. So let me uh, show a few pictures with this uh, architect. A uh, very serious uh, Scandinavian. Uh, Scandinavians in general are, are, are serious and intense. And I think we can learn things from them. He said that, uh, you know, all his life he tried to stay away from the, uh, you know, the specificities of uh, Northern architecture or Nordic architecture. But he couldn't actually do it, he said, because I guess, you know, you, you cannot. You cannot stay away or run away from yourself. And that's probably true. Um, so, Sver Fenn, Norwegian architect, Pritzker Laureate in, uh, two, in uh, 1997. Uh, his son uh, is also an architect. He's uh, still alive, his son. And uh, he had, uh, I don't know, four grand grandchildren and so on when he died. Some drawings by uh, Zwer Fenn. Uh, he worked for a while in France. He knew he met Le Corbusier. He worked in the office of Jean Prouvé. So, you know, he had uh, an interesting, uh, colorful, uh, professional life. Uh, this is a sketch for the uh, Nordic uh, Pavilion uh, in uh, the Venice Biennial. Uh, and we are going to see pictures of the work. A poe rather poetical drawing, I, I would say, it both conceptual and poetical. Uh, and this does say something about him that, you know, he, he was a poet of architecture in a discreet way. There is a touch of, I would say that there is a touch of uh, anxiety almost, or a, a touch of pessimism in his sketches, as far as I can tell. I thought, you know, this, this, this uh, vignette, or I don't know how to call it, this sketch, this drawing, uh, reminds me of something that I, uh, used to think of, you know, that uh, since the, the, the world is round, uh, you know, we, we think we, we stand up, but we actually might stand with our head downwards on this so-called sphere that um, the earth uh, seems to be. So, you know, uh, this changes everything because until Copernicus, you know, when when it was discovered by Copernicus that, uh, you know, it is the, the, the Earth that moves around the sun and not the other way around. Uh, and the flatness of the Earth was assumed as being true. Well, afterwards, things became rather confusing, I think, you know, because the notion of up and down, like, for example, this uh, little being that he drew here, if he said, if he used the word up, what would that have meant, you know, or the word down? 
And uh, by the way of this, I also am, I'm, I, I'm uh, speechless when I think that uh, the humans want to go to Mars together with the stars like Elon Musk and now big Bjarke Ingels, they make architectural projects for, for Mars, Mars. But on Mars, <laughs> you know, you have to wear a mask. You, I mean, not a mask like for the pandemic. You have to be dressed like a cosmonaut. Uh, uh, there is no gravity. I mean, there is very little gravity. Uh, there are all kinds of problems. You know, these people are mad. You know, uh, I, 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 they probably hate the Earth. Otherwise, I don't understand why they want to go in the for eight months. The journey will 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 be as long as six or eight months just to arrive there and never be able to come back. You can't ride a bicycle in your shorts on Mars. I don't understand the people. I really don't understand. Anyway, uh, so other sketch by uh, uh, by uh, our uh, uh, Norwegian architect Sverefen. But you can tell he was a thinker, you know, uh, uh, abstracting meaning uh, from, uh, you know, relationships between a pyramid and the sky and the hole in the earth or whatever. He was a thinker. Now, in 1958, he built this Norwegian pavilion at the Brussels World's Fair in Belgium. And, um, you know, uh, you could say nothing very special. Well, you know, look how the people were dressed. And, uh, you know, you realize this was, uh, you know, 1958 was still an early time, so to speak, in the emancipation of modernity at a general level. Of course, there were exceptional works like Villa Savoie or a few others, but this is a modern architecture that is. Uh, you know, international style is, is, is uh, you know, democratic, uh, thus is not authoritarian. Uh, so, uh, you know, and it has qualities, you know, it's, it's, it's even for the standards of today, I would say this building, if this building was built exactly as, it, as we look at now, it would have been published on Arch Daily or whatever. Anyway, but in 1962, so four years later, he built this excellent pavilion, the Nordic pavilion at the Venice Biennial, Biennale, Venice Biennale, which still stands. Uh, and uh, it's exactly as you see it. In fact, I visited this particular pavilion. I don't know, this was four or five years ago or something like this. And uh, its trademark is that there are a few trees within the pavilion that penetrate the, the roofing of the building, uh, kind of like in that house by uh, Lacaton and Vassal, except that this was done much earlier than the house by Lacaton and Vassal. Plus, this is a public, build, a public building, yes, so it's a little bit different. Um, but you'll see pictures, even here, you know, it, it's a tree that is outside, but still interacts with the building in some kind of, a, you know, conflictual dialectic. Um, it's not a bad building, it's not. And uh, look, this is, this is the, what I was trying to convey in words about, and uh, I think it's nice, you know, also because the interior is, is so, you know, well lit and, and light and, and, uh, and uh, you know, almost white. And then the black silhouettes of the, of the trees are very, um, you know, graphic. So this is uh, Zverefan in, in Venice, uh, the Venice Biennial. This is the pavilion uh, made for um, the Nordic countries, I guess, uh, Denmark, Norway, uh, Sweden. 
Finland now, because Finland has its own pavilion designed by Alvar Aalto, a beautiful blue building. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have pictures of it here, but you can uh, you can discover, you can see it on uh, on uh, you can see the, the pavilion by Alvar Aalto on the web. Maybe Iceland is also part of this group of Nordic countries. So Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Iceland. A villa from 1963, Villa Schreiner in Oslo. Um, of course, in, it is in the Nordic tradition to have uh, great respect for wood and to know how to work with wood in a, in a, in a uh, both uh, simple and dignified way. Uh, I think it's an it's a good building, you know, and uh, the way it is elevated from the earth makes you makes you think a little uh, about uh, certain Japanese architecture. But the respect for nature does exist in the Scandinavian countries, and uh, they do know very well how to work with brick, with wood. Uh, and uh, a sense of home is important for the Scandinavians because the climate, it's rather cold and, uh, you know, the home is the place where you go to in order to, you know, warm yourself up and, and, and uh, you know, uh, in contrast with the outside, the home is the center. Very rarely, in fact, yeah, very rarely there is flamboyance in the Nordic countries. You know, there is a sense of measure, which I admire very much. I, I like uh, Baroque art, Baroque architecture. I like even flamboyance sometimes, but I also admire the reticence of the Nordic people. And you can tell there is warmth, you know, because of the wood, there is so much wood that and wood is warm and uh, so the the scandinavian house is warm almost by definition because it uses a lot of wood it's cartesian yes but it's not made with steel or concrete well he uses that too and we'll see in public buildings later on but for for a private house a lot of wood So this is the, the plan of the house. Quite a large house, actually. Now, in my be, I look at those bananas, and uh, I, I remember, you know, that when when we paid homage to Joseph uh, Paxton, that apparently Joseph Paxton was the one who, uh, I don't know, grew uh, a banana that uh, became the the typical banana to be found in on the markets of Europe and the world. So, <laughs> you know, I guess. It helps to know a little bit about architecture because then you can connect even with the with the banana. Back to the house by Mr. Svere Fan and the, the good craft that uh, his work uh, shows here, not just in, in 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 the sense of how wood was used, but also brick. A comfortable house, obviously.
uh, it is organic without being organic. So this is, no one would describe this as an organic architecture, but because of the materials employed, you know, uh, it has a sense of the organic because he uses natural materials, wood, brick, even the screen on those walls. It's uh, it's a veg, you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's a natural material. It seems. 1963, 1964, another villa in Sweden this time. This one is a little more uh, sophisticated and uh, exotic, but it's interesting. You look at the plan, it's, uh, you know, central, centralized and somehow symmetrical. Uh, again, just like in the build, the previous building, the cluster of the, you know, the, the, the bathrooms or, and, and the kitchen, is in the center and then the larger rooms around. But if you look at the plan and then you look at the house from the outside, you'll realize that uh, there is a difference. For example, at uh, Villa La Rotonda by, <clears throat> by uh, Palladio, you know, once you read the plan, you look, see the plan and you see the building from the outside, there is no surprise. But here you don't realize from the outside the centrality and almost symmetry of the building as you do from the plants. Uh, and this is very interesting. Like, look, this is, this is how the building looks like. And of course, if you begin to analyze it, uh, you, come, you come to understand that, yes, this is the plan. But somehow he was able to break the rigidity of the, of the centrality and the symmetry and if I would have shown first this picture, you would have been sure, as I was sure, that this is an asymmetrical building. But it is not an asymmetrical building, as you, as you saw. And also maybe because of the landscape, and it's interesting. It's, I, I think it's a nice modern building made with brick, with some glass, with wood. Uh, and uh, also the landscape helps to to imagine that it is more asymmetrical than it actually is. Because look at the plan, it's uh, you know, almost perfectly symmetrical. The way he handles the dialogue with the outside is through these corners. So exactly where the building recedes, he comes with the glass of this square in uh, an expansionist move. So, exactly in the concavity, the Cartesian concavity of this corner, he brings in a convex configuration, if I am to use such a word, because it's a Cartesian uh, geometry. Uh, so this square breaks the, uh, the, 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 the cross that would have existed outside, and through these corners, the building expands towards the outside, because here there is glass and is an interesting window there. You see, it's this one. So I think he, he, he did something interesting here. You know, here you have opacity, opacity, and then that square that we saw in the plan breaks through, through these corners and expands towards the outside. And yes, indeed, this, this corner, uh, the, the window, the corner window is, is uh, done in a special way. And I hope I have a, uh, well, I have this drawing here. It's here, kind of like in a Villa de Luis Can, uh, was it the Fisher House or I forgot the name, where the, the, the frame of the window also incorporates uh, pieces of furniture. So the frame and the furniture are uh, brought together and also the glass. So it's an interesting, I hope I have pictures of, of uh, what is happening here because it's actually very, very uh, telling. Uh, but uh, this is the so-called conceptual model of the house. As you can see, it's, 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 it's symmetrical. It makes me think of the Jewish, uh, a public bus in Trenton by uh, Louis Kahn and Anting. Uh, but but the, the, the build building gives a different impression. Yes, this is the, 
I would say the very nice uh, corner uh, uh, glass window that he made, because it's not just a simple piece of glass, you know, it's, uh, you can see it's fragmented, it's a little bit in steps, you can even deposit things here, so there are some shelves, so it's not just, you know, two plain pieces of glass, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's more, it's, it's hybrid, it's complex. It's architecture and furniture at the same time. Look, this is the corner. And I think it's, it's very uh, ingenious and uh, useful, functional, and interesting aesthetically. Here you see it again, but without, I guess, a uh, table was built or incorporated. And uh, anyway, an interesting idea, and uh, this can be explored by other people as well. Because otherwise, as you can see, the conceptual plan is quite, quite simple and, uh, you know, uh, you didn't expect the, the richness of the, the external views looking at the plant. So the, the kitchen receives light from above. I mean, through, through these, uh, you know, windows above the, the level of the, of, the, of the roof around it. I guess the ventilation is not a problem. Again, the same, uh, the same corner that I mentioned is here. And uh, the fact that he negotiated between the presence of glass and the presence of something that almost approaches being a, a piece of furniture, this gives this corner a special, uh, uh, special attributes, I would say. Yes, because, uh, you know, you can display certain things there, you can put an ashtray, you can put, uh, you know, some glasses or whatever, plants. It's interesting. It's an interesting idea. Uh, this, this is what I was trying to talk about, the Sphere Fence Fragmented Windows which I like very much. And you wonder why did they, why did he make them like this? Why like this? Why not just a plain piece of glass? Well, because, uh, you know, it, it's, you see that the, this corner uh, expands is, it, 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 it is a gesture of moving towards the outside through this corner but not indifferently with, with character. And that's because you see even the child here is, you know, he is sitting here, it's, it's a place. In other words, he created a place. The word in Romanian would be loc, L-O-C, loc, or uh, locus if you want in Latin, or it's a, it's a place. He, he, he was a placemaker right there. You see here, there is another person, maybe a child. And, Obviously, this corner attracts because it's well made. It's a place. He was a placemaker, uh, Svera fan, when he did this. A 1967 house in Oslo, uh, different from the previous uh, uh, house, although here also we have this kind of uh, uh, corner window, which is um, more than just a window because it incorporates a sitting, uh, sitting area. In, a, in essence, the architecture is simple. You know, you have a square. Well, yes, he rotated uh, this part here, but uh, in, in the previous house also, there was a central, you know, core, uh, but all in all, it's, it's not difficult to read the functions at all of his plans. 
uh, here things are more complicated because of the landscape and that there are various levels and so on but but again the simplicity of the plan wouldn't make you expect what you see because what you see has a level of complexity which the plan uh, doesn't really uh, you know uh, make explicit and this is also a beautiful architecture i would say very much scandinavian you know with warm you know with 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 brick with wood uh, respecting the landscape and yet accepting the human presence. Now a museum, he builds um, uh, some important buildings with this function. This is the Hedmark Museum in Hamar, Norway, 1967-1979. So, you know, the construction lasted for 12 years. And this is one of his most important works. Uh, it's, um, it's, a, it's a hybrid work. It's a work which is not very easy to read. It has a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, things going on, uh, complexity, because it was also handling uh, an existing situation. And you can see that Sverefen was a modernist, although he claimed that he didn't th think of him as a, as a modernist. And by the way, I read that he traveled to Morocco and that he was very admirative of um, uh, the vernacular architecture in Morocco. Um, which is, of course, very different from the Scandinavian uh, uh, tradition. But you see here the, 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 the audacious modernist gesture, concrete, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, penetrating, long, uh, um, you know, uh, I don't know how to call it. Uh, it's a bridge. It's a, it's, 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 it's destined for circulation, but it attacks the old building. It's, it's quite, uh, you know, uh, willful and, uh, and I would say dramatic. And then, you know, he also has, well, those two people have no relationship to Svera Fan, I imagine. I just saw this picture. Um, it's, it's this bridge that is so architectural in the sense that it is so willful that shows the power of modernity in a context which is otherwise uh, rather um, ambiguous because of, of the existing buildings and the you know the the, the wooden work of the roof uh, so there is also tradition there is also innovation um, it, it's a complex work it's rich and look at the outside you know it's uh, you, you can tell, you know, there was an existing old building and there are interventions of the new architect, uh, but these are interventions are both um, not provocative, uh, assertive of the time that when they, they took place, but also, you know, accommodating the past. So in this sense, like here, you know, this is a traditional building, which he kept. And uh, at the same time, he contributed to it uh, through various gestures, more or less, uh, uh, you know, assertive. So I, I like this, uh, you know, this um, interplay between the past and the present. Uh, old artifacts. Maybe this was a meal, I don't know. It looks like it or something, uh, you know, but uh, a space of production, which became a, a museum. And here, look at the, the way he uses the glass, you know, very, very differently from what we saw in the in the previous houses. 
you know, a very, I would say, a very modernistic gesture, just attaching, uh, you know, large pieces of glass to the stone wall without a frame. And then the interior also, uh, it's, uh, you know, rather, you know, dramatic because of the uh, tension between stone and, and concrete and wood and glass. So this is a museum, you see some, uh, uh, you know, uh, objects that are displayed within the museum in a, in a rather dramatic way or sculptural way or certainly artistically uh, done. Interesting work. So this is uh, Sver Fenn, the, uh, the important Norwegian architect. Uh, as far as I know, the, the first and until now, the only Norwegian architect who received the Pritzker Prize in Architecture in 1997. Maybe this is him. It's a little difficult for me to recognize him, but it might be that it is him or it was him when he was younger. Anyway, um, an interesting work also because of the presence of time and archaeology, you know, and so it's, it's the meeting place between uh, the past and the present and maybe even the future and various technologies, those of the present, those of the past, interesting work and interesting not just for the building itself but also for the the way you know the, the displayed works are uh, uh, are shown like here for example in a, in a sensitive and artistic uh, way creative way Maybe there is also a slight touch of melancholia because of the, you know, uh, suggestions of the passage of time and the presence of the ruin. The circulation is, is very well resolved and uh, rather, you know, uh, I mean, it's dynamic, it's, it's dramatic almost, you know, the way it interacts with the, with the existing building. He didn't have to do it the way he did it, just for uh, functional reasons. For functional reasons, he could have done it in a less dialectical and uh, even provocative way.
a good work. Now, this is not a villa, it's not a house, but it makes me think of what uh, Palladio said, that a uh, house should, it should be like a, a small city. And what I see here, you know, this, this building uh, is in a way like a small city. I, I look here and I could imagine that, that this is, uh, you know, uh, a certain part, maybe an important part, maybe a central part of a city. And then I realized that actually it's, it's a building, not so large, in fact, but he, he, he managed somehow to, to, to bring urbanism into architecture in this work. Now, a villa in 1990, uh, here, personal, this, personally, I think this tower is a little bit too um, placidly, uh, you know, result architecturally uh, because of this, um, you know, uh, roofing that which is so, in a way, uh, to be expected, too much so. But uh, otherwise, also because of the landscape, uh, there is drama. The plan itself, it, it's a house. This one is a house, but it's uh, not much smaller than what we saw previously in that uh, museum. It's quite a large house. This one to me is more static uh, than, and particularly I would say, I don't think he's re resolved properly the, the ending, the top part of this tower is too, too common this, I think, uh, and uh, too literally uh, referring to, a, you know, uh, to tradition. Here, you don't see the top very well. So, you know, you might, I personally think this tower uh, has some problems in terms of architectural expression. Otherwise, there are interesting uh, things going on here. Again, you have concrete wo wo work and you have great wooden work and uh, the, the conjunction between the two uh, it provokes, uh, you know, uh, some architectural poetry and even some architectural drama. Yeah, the, this tower bothers me uh, the way he did it. Uh, but otherwise, there are interesting things and, and, and valuable things here. Zverefen, The Pattern of Thoughts. This was a book, I guess, published, um, The Pattern of Thoughts. 1991-2002, Norwegian Gla Gla Glacier, Glacier Museum. The Glacier Museum, interesting. I didn't know there was a museum, a Glacier Museum. Um, the landscape uh, overwhelmingly uh, you know, present. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, to be honest with you, uh, I like his architecture, but not completely. I, I, uh, I, I think he, he could have, uh, I, I feel there are some parts which could have been done a little bit better, but probably this is because he assumed a difficult past to respect you know, what we call tradition to, to, to not uh, go beyond the border with the uh, audacity. But sometimes, uh, I mean, I don't know, to negotiate between the past and the present is not easy. And when you also have to, to handle the, the presence of such impressive, uh, you know, mountains around, it's not easy. But uh, 
anyway, he he did uh, what what he had to do, I guess. It's I still think his architecture is not sufficiently um, courageous somehow. This is what I feel. It is modernistic. It is he takes some risks, but um, I, I feel that um, perhaps he could have done more. Uh, this is my my perception. I, I could be wrong, but th this is what I feel. Like even this entrance here, you know, it's rather weak. I mean, um, it could have been strong because of the triangle, which is geometry, and then you have the organicity of the mountain behind. But it's, I don't know. I, I don't think it's very, very, very powerful that entrance powerful in the good sense of the word, because powerful could also, the word could be used in, in, in a less, uh, uh, you know, positive way. But there are interesting things, just like in the previous building, uh, there, is, uh, there is variety and there are all kinds of things happening here. Is this critical regionalism, to use the words that uh, actually Kenneth Frampton apparently borrowed from a Greek architect, is uh, is usually associated with these two words, but uh, it seems uh, there was a Greek architect before who, who, who used them. Anyway, it was Frampton who brought them to, uh, to the attention of the whole world. In a way, it is some kind of critical regionalism. The regionalism is, is uh, expressed through, you know, the specificity, specificities of the place where he built in, in Norway. And uh, critical is because uh, he also invents things. And um, those inventions could be more explicit or less explicit. In other words, is uh, is about the interplay between the past and the present. In essence, I think. It is possible that uh, an experience, you know, uh, I mean, experiencing the building there where it was built would add new dimensions to the perception because it does seem that you know uh, the, the building has uh, its own dynamics which are a little bit difficult to imagine or comprehend from far away just looking at the pictures there are architectures which maybe do not look very impressive in pictures but they are uh, much more moving uh, when experienced in, 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 in reality. This is, uh, I don't know what Aukrust Center is uh, in Alvdal, Alv uh, 1993, 1996. You saw that he has a liking for this kind of arrangement of very long, elongated and rather narrow uh, buildings. I guess it's another, some kind of a museum. If these are ceramic tiles, and maybe they are, I think these, these are a positive addition to the building, you know, because all of a sudden we have uh, uh, the treatment of this sloping plane, which is, uh, you know, uh, plastically uh, rich, uh, engaging, uh, and it connects also with, uh, with the landscape, I, I would say, it's a good idea. And it also has this fragmentation derived from the fact that there are tiles. Dan, Dan uh, this, this looks like it's a flagstone. Uh, ceramic tiles will not 
uh, bear external weather who told you that i mean the, i can tell you uh, about so many buildings covered with ceramic tiles uh, just think of uh, gaudi for example but not just him there are plenty of buildings with ceramic tiles uh, on, on them okay I don't know what it is, but it's it's. I I think it's 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 a good uh, and surprising addition to uh, his repertoire because before we didn't see something like this. Obviously, he was exploring other ways of uh, of, uh, of building, which is good. While he still relies a lot on wood, and uh, it's good that he does. Although this means cutting down trees and forests, but uh, what can we do? Well, I guess we can abstain from doing that. It's, it's, it's a conflict between man and nature. We want to build, we have to use materials. And you know those materials, either we produce artificially or we gain, we obtain from uh, cutting down trees or I don't know what. Uh, it's, maybe we should abstain from building too much, maybe at the time of so much uh, need for uh, sustainability. But I like the fact that he uses uh, stone and uh, you know, there are interesting uh, things going on here. I mean, just this, uh, you know, it is a door here and it's, it's eventful, you know, it's, it's well crafted and you have uh, concrete here, um, stone here, wooden glass here, and here, I don't know what it is, you know, is it uh, some kind of a metallic sheet or uh, even glass? I, I don't know, but I like this, this part of this, of, of this building. Another work in, uh, in, in Norway, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, another museum also on a, in, a, in a dramatic uh, uh, landscape. He's not, a, he's not a, his theatrics, uh, his sense of drama is uh, tempered by, uh, I guess, being a Scandinavian, although the Scandinavians had great uh, theater people. In fact, one of the greatest and maybe the greatest for me, Henry Ibsen was Norwegian. I love Henry Ibsen. I, I mean, I recommend you, I suggest to you, if you have time and interest, read Brand or The Master Builder by Henry Ibsen, truly an unbelievable playwright, a playwriter, incredible, uh, is um, one of the best. So the, the Norwegians, the Nordic people do have a sense of drama. They are quite capable of being dramatic. Uh, even the Swedes and uh, yeah, Usually the myth is that uh, the Scandinavians are rather calm and, you know, reticent and subdued. Yes, they, they can control their emotions, but the, the emotions do exist. Strindberg, the great Scandinavian, the great uh, Swedish writer was, uh, was a volcano, boiling, boiling, boiling. And Henry Gibson again is, 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 is beautiful, is magnificent. Anyway, um, then uh, Knut Hamsun, also Norwegian for whom uh, uh, Stephen Hall built um, kind of a museum or memorial house. It's the house of Henry Gibson. It's a museum also in Norway. Great writer, Knut Hamsun, unfortunately, and he got the Nobel Prize in literature, but unfortunately he sympathized with, uh, with, uh, with Hitler and uh, that uh, discredited him a lot. But as a writer, he was uh, beautiful. I, I suggest to you, if you have interest, to read a small book called Hunger by Knut Hamsun. Truly a great, uh, a great writer. Unfortunately, with uh, some blindness in the field of politics. Uh, this happens sometimes with artists. Artists are rather naive and uh, you know, they, they don't always understand uh, properly uh, politics.
I like this canopy here, and I even placed it on the the invitation or the, you know, the invitation I sent out. Uh, you know, he he made a, a it's it's a canopy. That's all it is. But it's it has character. It it has complexity. You know, look at it from this side. You know, it's it's rich. It's engaging. It's sculptural. It's artistic. Today I read that uh, apparently Philip Johnson uh, said that architecture is an art and nothing else. I mean, you put it very bluntly, but I, uh, if architecture moves us, it moves us because it is an art. I, if it was not an art, it would not move us. You know, so those who try to discredit uh, architecture that is not an art, I think that we can have a second, uh, they should have a second uh, uh, thought about it. But it is a complicated art, it's true, but it is an art. You know. It moves your heart, it moves uh, your, uh, your emotions are stirred up by a good building. Well, that is an art. And those people who say it's not an art, I tell them, well, it's certainly not a science because I mean, yes, it has, it needs science. It's, it, it has parts which connect with science. Yes, I agree. But I never saw a history of science having architecture in its pages, never. Architecture is never in the pages of the histories of science, but architecture is almost always in the pages of the books on the history of art. Why? Well, <laughs> the answer is not complicated. Unfortunately, we degraded architecture to a lot of uh, significance uh, through functionalism and uh, homo economis, um, economicus is threatening architecture all the time. Now, this is a house from 2007 in Oslo, but it's not really a house. Why is it called a house? Ah, it's, uh, it's a public building where he incorporated an old house um, he kept, I guess, uh, he had, uh, he always had a liking for the vernacular, for the old, it was his nostalgic side. That's why he said that he tried all his life to move away from the, you know, the, the old or traditional Nordic architecture, but he didn't really succeed. And he said, because you cannot run away from yourself. So I guess he was very Norwegian. He was very attached to the culture of his country. And, uh, you know, even if he wanted to invent, even if he was a creator, uh, there was something that, you know, uh, resisted a total uh, break, breaking away from, um, you know, the, the specificities of his culture. Maybe that's why he kept this old building within the uh, newer structure. On one hand, he kept those trees you saw in the Venice Biennial Pavilion, the Nordic Pavilion. Here he kept uh, uh, not nature. I mean, yes, there is that little you know, tree there, but uh, uh, here he, he kept uh, the old culture, so to speak, symbolized through this old building. Otherwise, the, the, the new building is thoroughly modern. So I guess he, he, he had dualities and has, has had, had duality, dualities, dualities in his um, uh, dealings with the architecture and maybe even life. A nice skylights. Now, the National Museum of Art, Architecture and Design in Oslo, 2003-2008. Um, the Scandinavians, most of the time, well, we have Ingels now, but most of the time they do not uh, exhibit, uh, you know, a great liking for extravagant gestures. So there is always a sense of measure and equilibrium and balance and reticence. Even here, you see, uh, it's, it's a modern building, but it's not flamboyantly so, it's restrained. 
both inside and outside. A very well crafted. In my opinion, a little, little bit uh, too much glass, considering that it's a Nor Nordic country, but uh, what can you do? The, the seductiveness of glass uh, seems to be uh, almost unstoppable. Although these days we better be more careful with this glass because without uh, a lot of expenditures on energy, uh, it's difficult to, to use so much glass. Well, Norway has the money, of course, but uh, that's beyond the point, actually. And I think this is the last uh, slide of this presentation. As he, as I mentioned before, he said in 1999 in A plus U, the well-known uh, architectural magazines from Japan, I have tried all my life to run away from the Nordic tradition, but I realized that it is difficult to run away from yourself. Happy birthday, as uh, very fan. That is so nice what he said in the end. <laughs>